we'll wait for a couple of minutes after. Shall we start? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Leadership Lecture Series titled Even Engineer Seat Ice Cream, presented by Alumni and Corporate Relations Office, IIT Madras. I'm Shweta Bhupati, and the speaker for today's session is Mr. Kavias Manian, the whole time director and member of Group Management Council, Kotak Mahindra Bank Limited. He has played a pivotal role in Kotak's journey from an NBFC to a bank and also has been instrumental in building strong transaction banking capabilities. He is an electrical engineer from IIT BHU Varanasi with a postgraduate in financial management from Jamnalal Bajaj Institute of Management Studies, Mumbai. Kavis Manian was also the president of consumer banking that led to over 600 branches and more than 1,000 ATMs across the country in just 10 years. He also set up the retail liability business from scratch and later managed the entire consumer banking business, including consumer asset products like home loans, cards, personal loans, business loans, loans against property, personal loans, MSME and others. He synergized and evolved a coordinated business strategy across asset and liability products of Consumer Bank, which resulted in setting up one of the best consumer banking franchises in Indian banking industry. Corporate Bank has grown significantly under his leadership with investment banking, institutional equities, and wealth management businesses, improving their leadership positions in the industry and himself has been influential in upgrading the technology of these businesses. Benevolent at heart, he has been acknowledged as one of the highest individual fundraisers at the Mumbai Marathon for several years. Uh, before handing over the session to Sir, I request all the participants to drop their queries in the question and answer section. All the questions will be answered towards end of the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let me begin by saying that it is indeed a pleasure to be here this evening. IIT Madras is an institution I hold in very high esteem. 
and it is my privilege to be here today. I too qualified as an electrical engineer from an IIT, though I use little of what I learned there today as a banker. So during my talk, if I address engineering community interchangeably as them, you, or we, I hope you understand. I was told the topic of this, uh, my talk in this series is left to me as a speaker. That was such a relief. At first glance, maybe you find my topic somewhat cryptic and random, maybe even frivolous. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I am a banker after all. So don't worry about finding meaning in the topic of my talk today, at least not yet. If all goes well, by the end of our chat today, you should find some meaning in it. I also hope my talk isn't too preachy, but does communicate something that all of you should find relevant. I do hope that we can make this an interesting session by making it a two-way discussion in the later part of this session. That way, I will also get the benefit of interacting with some young and active minds. That I will take as the reward for doing this session. To begin with, I must congratulate each of you for having gained admission to this August institution. We know that graduating from an IIT is like a passport to a world of opportunities. That is the first thing all of you have going for you. You might have heard about the concept of Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh from Hindu mythology in the context of corporates. Each has a role to play. Mahesh is about creative destruction. Vishnu is about sustaining and maintaining. And Brahma is about creating something new. In an organization, you typically need a mix of people who play all these roles. Engineers naturally sit in the Brahma paradigm. I am reminded of a quote that is attributed to Einstein sometimes, even though maybe Theodore Karman is the one who deserves the credit. Scientists investigate that which already is. Engineers create that which has never been. So by training, each of you is a miniature Brahma. That is clearly the second thing you have going for you. But I just want to spend a minute more on the Mahesh aspect. The creative disruptions you are seeing in various aspects of business and everyday life today is driven by Mahesh in us. Some organizations are taking, some very small organizations actually, are taking on the large established players. And these organizations look nothing like the incumbents in terms of size, nature, and talent. We all know that organizations and their composition are changing at a furious pace. The talent in areas like analytics, robotics, digital marketing, engineering, and technology are becoming far more valuable. The number of people in these areas, even in businesses like banks, is rising significantly, significantly faster than the traditional talent areas. This, I believe, is the third big opportunity for all of you. The fourth thing you have really going for you is what I call the great comeback of engineering. In the good old days, by which I mean the days of my parents, engineering was a middle-class dream along with 
may be medicine most people trained as engineers were actually creating that which has never been the great nation building agenda post winning freedom was led by engineers and scientists we built dams highways nuclear reactors and factories then there was a phase where engineers in india especially the iitians wandered a bit lost their way a bit many of us went on to sell soaps and toothpaste or to investment banks and financial services like yours truly many went abroad to find the dream engineering career and the ones who stayed here clutched at straws to connect the relevance of an engineering education to what they were actually doing in their jobs true engineers were struggling to find their place but and here is another piece of good news for you all over the last decade i sense a comeback of engineering look at the number of new age entrepreneurs trying to solve the problems of the world country and the common man through technology and digital means and look at the alumni of iits in that space a clear resurgence of course aided by many other factors in the environment isn't every problem now being looked at as an engineering problem now the way the world thinks is med tech ed tech wealth tech consumer tech and pharma tech and so on this is truly a big change and i do believe this is the comeback of engineering the intersection of digital with various facets of life and business has truly brought engineering center stage actually i am reminded of the song from the film gully boy apna time aayega actually apna time aa gaya let me share a personal anecdote i joined one of the best engineering companies in india after i finished my engineering degree and found that a company which claimed to be an engineers company gave a better deal to mbas than engineers i was so disillusioned that it drove me to an mba and then into finance and to where i am now thankfully that is not the case today engineers may do an mba but many are going back to jobs which can still be called engineering i am often envious of the position you people are in i wish i was 25 or 30 today i truly think the opportunity for engineers to go there and make a difference to today's world is tremendous several factors like the overall digital ecosystem the fundraising ecosystem are just so conducive to enable entrepreneurs who have a dream and a solution to offer this has to be the fifth and the biggest thing you have going for all of you but wait yes there are some challenges too now the tech revolution is also a double edged sword there are mahesh aspects to that affect engineers adversely as well why is that engineers tend to be what's thought of as left brain thinkers and we are proud of it isn't it logical rational algorithmic formula based high iq thinking but the biggest disruptions 
are happening in robotic automation artificial intelligence even as high a thing as chess is automated these are making the army of left brain thinkers and doers redundant the same is not true of the right brain thinking people the right brain thinkers are getting even more valuable their skills can't be robotized if you'd like to know more read the book a whole new mind by daniel pink which he wrote in 2005 as far back as 2005 where he argues that the future belongs to the right brain people that the future is a conceptual age moving ahead of the information age one of the things this means is that telling the story well is more important than giving the bare facts the power of narrative is more than we engineers normally think it is i believe that this is a challenge for engineers in general right brain thinking is not natural or obvious to us by virtue of our training however this is surely not an unsolvable problem the first step to solving a problem is to recognize that there is a problem first step is to be aware that right brain input is important but it is engineers themselves who have found a way of doing that design thinking much of the literature on design thinking says the first step in the design thinking process is to have the empathy to tune in to the needs of your users and customers the role of empathy should not be undermined the key is to identify the right problem to solve finding the right problem to solve comes from empathy solving the problem is the engineering part of it design thinking process encourages you to challenge the traditional thinking look for an innovation look for alternatives creative problem solving all of that once you recognize the problem to solve i am sure all of you notice that the first step is to empathize have we not seen many situations where the leader or a company is struggling with the question when we are doing so many things right and seemingly everything right why aren't the results stacking up the reason actually is that they aren't even solving the right problem however elegant the engineering solution is obsession with the elegance of the engineering solution is great but even more important is the obsession with finding the right problem to solve true leaders know the right problem to solve just as an aside the emergence of esg that is environmental social and governance is effectively emanating from the fact that empathy is an important theme for investors organizations and businesses and even governments and this trend will gather pace in coming years all managers including engineers will be judged by markets based on their empathy quotient i spoke of empathy as an important aspect of esg that was a small digression i made i wanted to make that digression having touched upon empathy in the context of my talk today and for another reason that esg is also an area of personal interest to me this is where eq or emotional quotient becomes 
just as important as the IQ that we all know well about. The top leaders in organizations actually need the right EQ levels to lead their teams and drive their decisions through emotions, empathy, and a deeper psychological understanding and connect with their customers and teams. Of course, this means recognizing different kinds of intelligence. IQ is not the only way to measure intelligence and engineers need to take note of that. This combination of opposing ideas going beyond using different kinds of intelligence is important. If you really look at innovation, it often happens at the cusp of disciplines. A med tech solution is happening at the cusp of medical and digital, for example. This means many things. First, recognize that interdisciplinary approaches to identifying and solving problems are the only way to breed the best of innovation. I know IITs lead the way in this and encourage their students to take interdisciplinary courses. But the interdisciplinary I am talking about is even wider than that. Even going forward, all of us need to embrace the idea of interdisciplinary learning very seriously all through our careers. Secondly, the humility to understand and learn from other disciplines is vital to bring, being able to work with other disciplines. Very often, not having a healthy respect for other disciplines is the hurdle to interdisciplinary understanding of the problem to solve. Appreciating that each discipline has a relevant role to play in the identification and finding the solution of the problem is crucial. Talking of interdisciplinary approach makes me think also about collaboration and alliances. I think the ability to manage collaboration across academia, industry, government, nonprofits, across global and local institutions, across streams and disciplines, and leveraging the network effect of all this will be key skill area for future managers. Managers need to appreciate that the world is getting more and more interdependent and they need to have the soft skills for managing these interdependencies. Being an IIT Madras alumni, at least you start with the advantage of having a great level of access to peers in different fields who will go on to work in different companies and in different countries. Of course, the concept of interdependence applies even to the network within organizations. Successful managers leverage the capabilities within the organization not only through hierarchy, but learning to collaborate and manage interdependencies with their peers and colleagues. So I urge each of you as engineers to bring adequate focus to these aspects of right brain thinking, design thinking, emotional quotient, empathy, interdisciplinary, and collaborative approach. Another soft aspect that needs your attention is the issue around handling ambiguity. In the VUCA world, all of you know what VUCA is. We know ambiguity is something we all have to deal with. The right brain people find ambiguity easier to deal with naturally. Managing ambiguity 
requires both left and right brain capabilities. Logic and creativity are both required in equal measure to deal with ambiguity. Most engineers being left brain oriented look for clarity and a well-defined path, whether, whether in their careers or in their day-to-day -day work situations. Dealing with ambiguity is an essential skill in the world going ahead. Engineers need to work hard at it. Managers need to be comfortable acting with ambiguous information. This is not like truly what engineering tells you. This does not come easily to left brain managers. The next thing I wanted to talk about was something vital that gets ignored all too often. The question of mental and personal well being. In our busy professional pursuits, while we remain focused on intellectual and economic growth, I have seen far too many people losing focus on their mental and physical well being, causing early burnouts, burnouts and not realizing their own full potential. The idea of a holistic growth across professional and personal areas needs careful appreciation. I believe that professional growth gets stunted for many people by the lack of their personal growth. Mental well-being is part of that personal growth. Physical well-being is an age-old concept of healthy body, healthy mind. Everyone intuitively knows this, but most neglect their minds and bodies. More importantly, the earlier each of you realize this and act upon it, the more leverage this can give you in your future professional endeavors. I urge each of you to give this aspect the attention it deserves. My own personal experience with my well-being was nothing short of transformational. I only wish I had paid attention to this earlier. 15 years ago, I was the hard driving, impatient man in a hurry, smoking 17 cigarettes a day, working 15 hours a day, highly focused on numbers, highly goal oriented, highly achievement oriented, I was doing extremely well in my career, but didn't have time for my family. Then the negative feedback started trickling in. I recognized it and decided to act on it. That was when I decided that in the next phase of my career, I need to focus on physical and mental well-being. From a smoker, I turned into a marathoner. I changed my, fit, my fitness levels. I step changed my fitness levels actually. I have got into meditation and journaling. I started karaoke singing and formed a band with some of my batchmates. We call it the band of 82. And we perform live in friendly gatherings. I regained my voice after I stopped smoking. I got involved in philanthropy. I got remarried, having lost my wife to cancer earlier. I changed my diet dramatically. I now do a reflective exercise every three months and write down my internal growth goals. These are not professional growth goals. These are personal growth areas across multiple facets, which include things varying from weight targets to medical parameter targets, to improving relationships with specific people. This has included my mother and my boss as well at times. One of these times I challenged myself to come up with one idea, big or small, every day. I failed. I came up with only 25 in a quarter. 
I did all this over a period of time. Of course, all this didn't happen overnight. The point I am making is that you can do a lot of things that focus on your personal growth. I think I achieve more even while I work less. Actually, I shouldn't be saying this. This can be a career limiting move. That is not what I tell my boss. To my boss, I say I'm working hard. Some people call this working smarter instead of working harder. I am able to do very wide range of things. I do believe that at my level, if working hard is my strong point, there's something wrong. I have been more stress-free in spite of my job inherently being a highly stressful one. My health parameters look better than they look 15 years back. I feel more energized mentally and physically. I have made new friends, different kinds of friends and discovered new aspects in friends that I can engage with. I could go on and on and on. I am a happier, more optimistic and a more effective person, personally and professionally. What I am saying here is that the softer and human aspects all through my talk, I have focused on softer and more human aspects. And I am making a point that they need attention. And if we really want to build a successful career as engineers, whether as entrepreneurs or as employees, it is important to focus on this. That was actually the context of the title of my talk. One of my marketing colleagues often says, that most hard-nosed businessmen still behave normally as most humans do. And as a right brain marketing person, his endeavor is to market to the softer human rather than the hard-nosed businessman. The point he's making is there is a softer side to everybody. And therefore, engineers need to be more than their high IQ, rational, logical selves and embrace the human and softer qualities to succeed. They do have the ability to do that. They do it in their personal lives to varying degrees. You do eat ice cream with your kids. My own career learnings are predominantly that softer aspects start mattering even more as you rise up the hierarchy. Even otherwise, the soft skill areas are a key means of differentiation. Even early in your careers. The areas of human judgment define make or break many times. Let me give you an example of a time when my engineering mind worked, but the softer part did not. And it turned out to be a big missed opportunity for me and for my organization. Much before UPI and Aadhaar were born, I had conceived of an open architecture payment platform we called KPay. I think we did a wonderful engineering job within the constraints of what existed, what ecosystem existed then. It was the first time such an attempt was being made by anyone. In some ways, it was the precursor to the payment fintech business. While I was sure on the engineering side, I am afraid I lacked the conviction to back it with the resources it needed to make it popular. I did not have the deep insight of the unmet need of the customer. That product could have created history, but did not. I operated as an engineer who had a good solution, but did not tune into that deep right brain human input required for making it a success. Luckily, I have had many instances where the reverse happened and I could leverage my softer skills to my and my organization's benefit. The reverse was actually true when the 
deregulation of savings account interest rates happened the traditional left brain banker view was that paying higher interest paying higher interest rates to attract customers to save with us would be seen as a desperation of a weak organization and a higher rate detracts from the polish of the brand higher the rating lower the rate was the so it was easy for an incumbent to compute the excess cost we will bear on our entire base if we change our interest rates on savings the odds seemed stacked heavily against us even in the best case scenario the break even math was that it would take doubling the base in 18 to 24 months but will that happen double the base in 18 24 months that took us 8 years before that to build very few people granted me that that was a leap of faith we had to make we had to change our mindset to a challenger mindset from an incumbent mindset many of you may recall the 6% rate advertisements of kotak we made that call and succeeded we did double our base in 24 months and rest as they say is history this was not a left brain call it was about how customers will react it was about our mindset interestingly the key lines of the campaign were quite math inspired again engineering mind 6 is greater than 4 why why take 4 6 is more another thing i believe very strongly is managers are only as good as the teams they have something often said about cricket captains too i am personally a big beneficiary of good teams with me in every single role i played in my career in several roles i found that it is possible to create a high performing team from a set of people who are seemingly under delivering or middling kind of like in the movie lagan of course i am exaggerating as was the case in the movie good talent is as indispensable so you don't need only middling people and it's the indispensable need of any business but i assume you get the drift i do believe that much of the success in my career comes from having chosen the right people empowering them and retaining them you might actually find it hard to believe but i really don't know how to handle a resignation letter from a team member i have only handled one in my entire career and that too was someone who quit but not to take up another corporate job i really can't imagine one of my team members being unhappy and me not knowing it or one of them looking for options without first asking me if i can find some options for them so building that kind of transparent relationship with your team members is a soft skill that i believe is critical for all of us as dale carnegie said when dealing with people remember you are not dealing with creatures of logic but creatures of emotion lastly at the end of my talk i do want to spend some time exhorting all of you to consider making india your karma bhumi the india opportunity is a unique confluence of critical scale global relevance and a near and medium term imperative to build domestic capabilities to de-risk geopolitics as well as an opportunity to turbocharge and step up into the next zone of economic success lifting us at least to the group of middle income countries all these together 
open opportunities like never before the next decade can belong to india with help from people like you india specific problems need india specific custom solutions unlike earlier generations you have the opportunity to build your careers or business in an incredibly rewarding way implications for you are immense while you leverage iit for global access there is a here and now opportunity to work on problems and build solutions using iit in these four or five years you are spending here now or later from here or abroad with a focus on india knowing that the need and the critical mass are there the us china and eu all have their own models for excellence and innovation at iit you can play a role in shaping india's answer to the kind of trajectory shifting work and research that the singhua university has done to change orbits in terms of research quality and quantity of quantity of research for example or work to lend more meat and heft to india's answer to the ecosystem effect and creation like darpa has done in us maybe there is no better way than this to be atmanirbhar to be independent this is truly the meaning of being independent the iits and us students here are the best placed to drive that transformation with imagination and energy overall think of the next few years as vital opportunity in your life to make an extraordinary impact on india's journey and global history i call upon each of you to construct your own plan to gain and blend excellence mastery and depth breadth of perspective including the softer aspects exposure especially across disciplines and different ways of thinking building personal and leveraging institutional connections and learning to learn over and over again thank you for spending your time listening to me all the best to each of you for a glorious future ahead i am happy to take questions and have some open discussions now thank you again thank you sir uh, we'll take some questions we received from the audience prior to the session uh, kimaya will moderate the question thank you ma'am good evening sir uh, this is kimaya so our yes, kimaya. first thank you. question uh, that we have is what is the future of traditional consumer banking which youth growth observe in the fintech space no so uh, you know um, this is always a continuum what was consumer banking 50 years back is not what it was you know uh, about 30 years back when atms and net banking were into or or later actually net banking came later atms were introduced 20 years back 25 years back it was different from consumer banking of the past and i think it is the same going forward things don't remain where they are there is nothing like a future of that past right future always is newly created and that applies to consumer banking as well i think consumer banking of the future is not going to look like the consumer banking of today and the players the who win that war will be players who adapt and keep changing with the needs of the uh, consumer and uh, in fact lot of my uh, lo uh, a significant part of my talk i spent on empathy on knowing the consumer need and players who understand and empathize with the need of the consumer and build their offerings in a manner that actually delivers to that need of the customer those are the players who will win and for sure that is going to be different from what it was in the past 
Thank you, sir. So the next question goes like, uh, what are your views on the current shifting trends in the world economy? In the world? Economics. So, uh, you know, this is a, a complicated uh, subject to cover in a short answer to this question. But you look at it this way. I think, uh, uh, you know, the big, the big economic power in the world in the pa past several decades has been the US, right? But it is not inconceivable that in the next decade, two decades, three decades, China, India are players who will have large enough economies which will be counterbalancing US as an economy. And Europe, if you look at, has the fact is Europe was a strong economy, big economy, but each country in Europe, the EU experiment is partly succeeding, partly not succeeding. So each country in Europe by itself will not have the size. Like somebody said, we will probably cross the size of British economy this year, who colonized us some years back, and we will be larger than them soon. So I think the, uh, the big econ the, uh, the landscape is changing. The big economies will be different from what they were. And I think uh, economies, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the European economy really did well in the industrial revolution time, right? Industrial revolution, uh, Europe was at the forefront of industrial revolution, right? And they were really there. But the next revolution, I don't know whether Europe is going to be there. So I think it is going to come out of the China and India as, as countries. And like I said, I, I, at the end of my talk, I asked each of you to, you know, be party to that. And I think uh, China, India can really be, be big economic superpowers in the next two, three, five decades. Yeah. It's never a short term story. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question goes like, uh, how did you tackle your failures and get back on track? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I talked about, you know, uh, the optimism that I bring to uh, uh, my life, my work all the time. And mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, many of you might want to uh, read up this. Optimism is not a natural trait with which you need to be born. You can learn optimism. And there is... Uh, uh, this topic is very well written. Uh, a lot is written about this topic. Learned optimism is a subject that you might want to Google and uh, read up. There are, there are some books written about this as well. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to recall the name of the author. It's not coming to me just now. But optimism is not something that a person is born with. It's not an inborn trait. You can build optimism. You can learn to be optimistic. So I think you just have to be, you just have to learn to be optimistic. There is always a, uh, a better future ahead. And uh, nobody, um, you know, uh, nobody uh, succeeds without failing. In fact, uh, I, I don't now recall word by word that uh, uh, saying, but Michael Jordan has been quoted as saying that, you know, there were several times he missed the winning shot in a match. Um, he missed um uh, uh, baskets which made the, uh, his team lose matches and that has happened several times to him but the question is whether he did he won more times uh, he made the right moves or uh, uh, took the right steps more times than the wrong steps he took so i think you have to just believe that as long as you can keep moving forward and take the right um, more number of times you take the right steps ahead, you are still making progress ahead, right? And uh, that's the way to think about it. You can learn to be optimistic. Sure, sir. Thank you. Uh, so the next question goes, uh, what are the three simple characteristics a leader should have in himself? Leader should have? A leader should have in himself. Right. No, I, I, I uh, my talk essentially talked about many of those characteristics, but if I have to pick three, like I said, I think uh, leaders must, uh, the three things I would uh, um, pick out of my, my own uh, uh, 
uh, talk, which uh, of course has more than three there. But I think empathy is clearly one of them. Um, empathy makes him uh, makes a leader have the right team uh, with him. Empathy makes him um, uh, closer to his customers. So empathy is number one. Number two, I would say, is uh, uh, the uh, the uh, 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 let me rank the second one. Uh, okay, so let me put it this way. Number two is, of course, he must have, uh, uh, he must be an optimistic and uh, uh, his, he should be a professionally and personally a wholesome person, right? Because I have rarely seen uh, people who are not personally grown succeed mm -hmm. professionally. Uh, some of the best uh, professionals have diverse interests. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I keep saying this, uh, engineers should learn to read fiction. It makes them a fuller person. So I think uh, that is a second. I would say uh, uh, the uh, mental and physical well-being part, as I said, I think that should be second. And third, of course, uh, good thinking, uh, strategic mind, yeah. But strategic mind, of course, as I said, is a, it comes to many people, right? Actually, I always believe strategy is, of course, good strategy is important, but good execution, uh, it's a cliche, right? Good execution eats strategy for <laughs> breakfast, right? Yeah. So I think, and good execution comes from other qualities that you possess, right? So, yeah. but yes, I would say that Good mind, good strategy, good strategic thinking is the third I would pick. Yeah. Okay. So, with uh, as you pointed out, uh, first being empathy. Uh, so, in your experience, the next question goes like: In your experience, how common is it that the organizations existing focus on embedding the culture of empathy? Because most of us have this perception of lack of empathy kind of atmospheres, which worries. Uh, many people into entering the corporate no so uh, you know there are organizations and there are organizations there are some organizations which give it value some which don't give it value my personal belief is that organizations which give it value are the ones who succeed in fact there is enough research um, on uh, empathetic leaders generally delivering better returns to shareholders and uh, uh, keeping better employee morale. So there is enough evidence. There is enough example in the corporate. Of course, all corporates are not alike. Some do better at it. Some don't do better at it. But I think, you know, uh, worrying about it, uh, it's, it's like this, you know, you stand outside a pond and uh, think of how deep it will be and therefore don't step into it. You can keep standing on the side, right? So uh, I would say, it should not cause a fear in you to enter into uh, corporate uh, life. I think you have to be optimistic again. And uh, mind you, you can make a difference in the place yes. you join. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so the next question we have is what are the opportunities for data science in finance and banking sector? Uh, the opportunities are immense. I mean, uh, customer behavior uh, using uh, and therefore offering the right products, right service to a customer is very core to banking, uh, consumer banking, and even now going forward in uh, wholesale uh, banking. Uh, therefore, data science, you might, you might not know that even a bank like Kodak Mahindra already has close to 500 data scientists working in Kodak Mahindra Bank. So uh, data science is here to stay and there is banks possess so much data about their customers and if they use it well, they can personalize delivery of services, products to their customers, um, uh, really make their customer experience different. So data science is, uh, I mean, it is uh, undoubtedly a, a field that has immense future in financial services in, in general, not only in banking, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, so the next question we have 
is uh, how does one have a balanced life and a successful life simultaneously you know some of these uh, are uh, i don't know the answer to this question is very easy just do it <laughs> right so uh, the but having said that i know that the pulls and pressures are very high but you know uh, again uh, one of my beliefs is if anything is important for you you will find the time to do it the only reason people don't find the time to do something is that they have not internalized that it is important for you so if you internalize something as important for you there is no reason you would not give it time right how is it possible that you think it is important and you can't find time for it sure yes so, so i think it is just believing that it is important and just do it is not a cliche yeah yes okay so uh, sir what methods do you use when you have to take a decision under some difficult circumstances what would be your suggestions regarding this you know uh, all decisions are always situational every situation demands different kind of decision making so uh, there are situations where you want your team to make the decision one person to make a decision you may want some team to make a decision a set of people to make a decision and you don't want to intervene or you may want to influence the team's decision and therefore you may influence it but not make the decision uh, you may because you may want them to make the decision and there are times as a leader you have to make the decision don't leave it to others like i told you the example in my career there are times when you had to just make a decision because that decision would not have got taken by consensus so there are times when consensus works there are times when consensus does not work and you have to identify what is the correct situation and what the, the process you will make to take that decision in that situation so there are breakout moments crisis moments where the leader has to step in and make the decision but there are vishnu moments which are sustenance and those kind of moments you can let consensus make the decision yes yeah okay thank you so much sir um i think with that we have come to an end of the q and a session uh, thank you so much for answering all the questions and on behalf of the entire itm i would like to extend you a very hearty vote of thanks for this insightful engaging and very interesting session it was really quite informative so thank you so much for taking out your time from your busy schedule and last but not the least i would also like to thank the audience for their presence and for making this webinar a grand success thank you thank you so much thank, thank you, you very much thank you good night